The Hawker Hurricane is one of the most outstanding machines in the history of military aviation. It was the first monoplane interceptor in RAF service, the first combat aircraft to exceed 300 miles per hour in level flight, and the first eight-gun fighter. In the fateful summer of 1940, the qualities of the Hawker Hurricane would be tested in the most significant air battle of all time. This aircraft, in the hands of the skilled and brave pilots of Fighter Command, proved to be the most important single factor in the RAF's final victory. A few short months earlier, Britain's chances of survival had looked grim. A mere 22 miles from the British coast, Hitler's amphibious assault force was assembling. Before the invasion could be mounted, the Luftwaffe had to secure air supremacy. Opposing this objective stood only 367 Hurricanes and Spitfires. Goering had calculated that Britain's southern air defences could be smashed in four days, and in a further four weeks the whole of the RAF could be annihilated. In France, Denmark and Norway, Goering assembled three huge wings or Luftflotten consisting of 2,800 combat aircraft. Eagle Day, the beginning of the air offensive, was scheduled for early August. It was planned that five weeks later, the invasion force would cross the channel. History would go on to prove, however, that the Nazis had seriously miscalculated. In the subsequent months, the small fighter force of the RAF distinguished themselves. Out of all the German aircraft destroyed, two-thirds were attributable to the Hawker Hurricane. PZ-865 was the last Hurricane of 14,583 to be built. Carrying the markings of 261 Squadron, it now flies with the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight based at RAF Coningsby. Known as the last of the many, today it is piloted by Flight Lieutenant Paul Shenton. The first thing we do when we come up to the aeroplane is to check out its, uh, the basic services are there and that it's safe for us to do an external inspection of the aeroplane. We're checking there are no selections made on the hydraulic services. We need to check on the gauge that sits between our feet that we have pneumatic pressure available for the brakes. To make sure that the engine is safe, we ensure that the ignition switches are off. Again, checking all the alignments on the panel screws, exhaust stubs, doing that, if it sounds uh, any different then we know we've probably got a crack in it, etc. Come forward to the propeller, general condition of all the blades, and checking there's not too much movement in it. And again, all the fasteners are in line. Second wheel, condition, creep marks, brake, doors, and the bay. Nothing wrong there. Back again to the leading edge, checking the general condition of the leading edge. Manning light, the condition's good, and the cover is fine. We've now done the external checks, and we're happy with the outside of the aeroplane. We now need to set up the cockpit ready to start up. First thing we do is energize the electrical system. We check that the battery has sufficient voltage in to allow us to start. Check that the radiator flap is open, and then all the trims. First the elevator, checking for full and free movement, and selecting a neutral. Then the rudder trim, full and free movement, selecting it fully right to help us counter the effects of torque on takeoff. Moving round, selecting the uh, brakes and the parking brakes on. And now ready to prime the engine to start up.
once you're airborne and uh, flying around, the things that uh, struck me, when you compare it to a jet airplane, the controls are a lot heavier. You have to coordinate rudder with the aileron more than you would if at all in a, in a jet fighter. In fact, in the jet, you, you tend to just use the rudder pedals for steering yourself on the ground and as foot rests in the air. With this airplane, with the secondary effects of roll, being your of the airplane, you need to work the rudder at the same time as the uh, aileron and elevators. It's very, very noisy. In a tornado, you could actually talk to each other in the air without the intercom, you can shout. In this aeroplane, uh, display power settings, you, you, you're doing your damnedest to actually hear the radio. So the first thing you'll notice is the immense amount of uh, torque effect for this aeroplane. With over a thousand horsepower, you, you would expect it. So you're fighting that off with lots of rudder, making your feet work, which I'm not really too used to with uh, the Tornado and most jet aeroplanes are fairly stable on the ground and pretty much go fairly straight. So we're fighting that. We then need to lift the tail wheel by pushing the control column forward. So we lift the tail wheel to get the aircraft in a level attitude. Again, if you're used to a tricycle undercarriage, like in your Cessna 172, it'll be a different and you'll be pulling back to get the nose wheel off just before you get airborne. Get to climbing speed and this aeroplane you need to uh, quite a, a, a positive check to get her airborne. You're up in the air and the overall feel of the aeroplane is lovely. When you get chance to look out, look in the mirror, look at the tailplane, look out at the wings and everything else, and just take in the whole atmosphere of it and the feeling of flying the aeroplane, she's, she's very nice. By the end of the First World War, the role of the fighter had been defined. Its task was to win control of the skies over the battlefield and prevent the enemy from bombing, strafing or spying. The most famous British fighter of the First World War was the Sopwith Camel. The Hurricane claimed direct lineage to this aeroplane as Sopwith evolved into Hawker engineering. The Camel's construction was typical of the day, a skeleton of wooden formers braced with wires and covered in canvas. Its biplane format gave it tremendous wing area for its size, making it very maneuverable and well suited to close combat. Towards the end of the war, the Germans were experimenting with monoplane designs. However, it was generally felt that the biplane's agility made it better suited to aerial combat. This conviction would seriously disrupt the development of the monoplane for a considerable period after the First World War.